on this episode of the Insure Tech Geek Podcast, talking about building strategies for a resilient insurance future with Lisa Wardlaw from 360 Digital Immersion. The Insure Tech Geek Podcast, powered by JB Knowledge, is all about technology that's transforming and disrupting the insurance world. We'll be interviewing guests and doing deep dives into specific tech we see changing the industry. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech, so enjoy the ride and geek out. And we are back with another great episode. I'm probably the, I, 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 nay, I say most excited about this one because, you, you know, when you anticipate something and then it doesn't happen and then you anticipate it more and then it doesn't happen and you anticipate it more and then it finally happens, that's the situation I'm in because it turns out that um, Lisa and I, have busy schedules <laughs> and, and getting, them, getting them to both line up has been a monumental effort. And we almost had to reschedule again. And I said, no, no, nay, this shall not happen in this my castle. And, um, and so we got it scheduled for today, which I'm really excited about. And with me, of course, my illustrious co-host, the most interesting man in insurance, Rob Galbraith. Rob, what's going on, buddy? Hey, James. It's going well. And, and I will let our, our viewers and our listeners in uh, a little behind the scenes. So, um, you know, usually as we book guests, you know, I get the invite and and so you'll see them kind of pop up, right? Okay, we got a recording schedule with this person and that person. And um, I've loved everyone that we've talked to. Very, very interesting. But there are certain guests and we have one of us with us today where the name comes across the, the email. It's like, oh, yes, we get to sit down with Lisa Wardlaw and record a show. So anyway, I'm super excited about today's episode. I yeah. thought you were just going to say you were hopeful I didn't stand you up again. I'm joking. <laughs> exactly, right? I mean, you know, to be fair to Lisa, and again, our guest from Atlanta, Georgia, Lisa Wardlaw. Lisa... Um, it was kind of 50 50, you know, I mean, I, I, I had some stuff that came up and you had some stuff that came up. And so to be fair to her, it was, uh, it was equally me parts, me and her on, uh, on the, the multiple cancellations and reschedulings, but look, it's gonna be totally worth it. It's gonna be totally worth it. Um, Lisa and I have a lot in common and, um, it's been fun because, you know, like a lot of other things in the, in, in sure tech thought leader community, people who speak and moderate and podcast and do things around insure tech, um, you know, Rob and Lisa and I are pretty active. And, and so we end up seeing each other at a lot of different conferences. Lisa and I have been at the last couple of Reuters conferences and we're going to be at another one coming up in Toronto. And so it's been really fun getting to hang out with her. And um, she's just as crazy as I am, which is, which is exciting because uh, when you get two positively insane people together, then hilarious crap. What he's not to... telling you, Rob, is that I cut the line for the barbecue. <laughs> I'm like, she did. I'm, she did. I'm with you. You're my date tonight, right? She did. She just <laughs> totally like, cut the line. What are you doing? And I'm like, and I'm, really like I'm like, you know, in, in Texas, they don't take kindly to to Yankees coming in. Uh, <laughs> I am not a Yankee from Atlanta. I love it. <laughs> She's not a Yankee. Hey, um, I know you're you're from the South. Atlanta is definitely the South, Lisa. What do you, what's the difference between a Yankee and a damn Yankee? The D. <laughs> no. Damn Yankees come south and stay. Ah, uh, yeah. I, See, my dad would have probably gotten that one right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so was I'm actually going to go for the Mason-Dixon line. And the reason why I was going to go for that, so that's where you say Coke versus soda. And then we won't yeah. go to the pop. <laughs> But there's a lineage, right, Rob? There's a lineage in the United States, like there you is. can tell where someone's from by how they call a carbonated beverage. It's like the quickest yeah, place it, in the world, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, every, everything, and of course, you know, the headquarters of Coca-Cola, Atlanta. I mean, everything for us is a Coke. Like, I grew up in Baton Rouge. Do you want a Coke? Yeah, what kind? Oh, you know, Sprite. Exactly. Like, exactly. That's, that's kind of what Coke was the, <laughs> the phrase. The Coke. And of course, yeah. in Michigan, <laughs> In Michigan's a pop state, I think. I mean, that's it what is. I've heard a lot. <laughs> it yeah, is. It tends to be state. Pepsi, definitely pop or soda pop. And uh, yeah, there's also yeah. the mayonnaise line. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, right? So there's like the north half of the country's Miracle Whip and the south half is mayo. Oh. Okay. 
Miracle Whip is not mayo, just to put that no, out there. Sure. <laughs> Miracle Whip is a salad dressing, but we could go into that. We could we could have a whole dialogue and discussion about what is your mom using deviled eggs? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's jump in. Um, we love talking about insurance. We love talking about about tech, but on this show, we love talking about the people behind it first. And uh, Lisa's one of the people behind InsureTech. Her company, 360 Digital Immersion, that's 360-360-digitalimmersion.com. You can find out more about it there. Of course, you can hit her up on her LinkedIn. She she may or may not be on LinkedIn once or twice a day or 20 times a day. Um, so you can definitely hit her up. I mean, I for me, Lisa, like LinkedIn is by far my number one. I care about the other social platforms about like 5% of what I care <laughs> about LinkedIn. So LinkedIn's where all the action is. Um, that's right. That's where we get to so hang Lisa, out, man. Exactly. So let's talk about you for a second. Um, you uh, you went to Rhodes College. Uh, you got a business degree. Uh, I went to Texas A and M. Got a business degree. Um, you you have a great background, and your background starts with the same firm that mine does. Because I did I did a grand total of six months, two internships <laughs> at Price Waterhouse Coopers. Um. At the same time, so you were in the Atlanta office, I was in the Dallas office, and I was in this global risk management, Grimm's Global Risk Management Services. Yeah, I remember those, those acronyms. <laughs> yeah, you, you remember Grimm's. And I was in this little, little cool practice area called sys.com, which was uh, security integration services. Is back when an audit firm could audit you and then find the problems and then get paid to fix them and then get paid to audit their fixes. Yeah, which is literally the glory days. I don't know what the, I know, like the glory days of accounting when you, when you had an obvious conflict of interest and nobody <laughs> said anything about it. Um, so you worked for eight, you survived. Most people survived two years at the big five. You survived eight somehow. Yeah. And then I went back and did it for two more. Wow. I have a sucker decade. for punishment. I, I mean, know. seriously. And uh, and then you 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 go from that to Voya Financial, and you're there for a year. And then you go to Home Depot for a couple of years um, as senior manager of global sourcing finance. And then Titus Consulting for a year. Then you know NBIS for a year. And then you go back to Price Waterhouse for a year. And then you embark on an 11 year journey at Munich Re. So let's talk about like leading up to Munich Re. Like, when did you did you grow up in? Did you actually like grow up in Atlanta? Like high school, middle school? No, no. did not grow up Where'd in you, Atlanta. Where'd you I grow grew up? up? In Florida, in a little small uh, town in Missouri called Cape Girardeau, Missouri, on the river, because my dad was in avionics. I, I think I shared that with you, and during one of your flight LinkedIn posts, um, my dad owns still to this day owns an avionics shop and as a small aircraft pilot you can probably understand that you go where there is availability of a shop which is usually if somebody retires and they don't have somebody a family member that's going to succeed them and run their business yep, and so, that's how it works. yeah so my dad was originally in orlando working for big avionics companies and his brothers were all in small avionics in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. <laughs> and um, that's where I was born. <laughs> Little known fact. And um, <clears throat> he found somebody that was uh, retiring and didn't have any, you know, buddy to sell a shop to in Cape Jordan, Missouri. So I spent like from fourth grade through college, um, you know, with uh, my family living in Cape Jordan, Missouri. And then they both, both my mom and my dad had separated at the time they divorced and they both went back to their kind of native places in Florida. So yeah, combo, Florida, Missouri. Nice. And I've, I've actually landed um, when, when flying a plane at Cape Girardeau, I had to get some fuel there. Yeah. And so I've, I've been there, been to the airport. Um, always, always in need of a good avionics guy, by the way, avionics, good avionics shops are almost impossible to find. Um, so you, so you, what, what did you want to be? Like, you, did you want to be an auditor? Did you want to be in accounting? Or like, no, no, like, I mean, no. like, let's go, let's go back to like, let's yeah. go back to like 20 year old Kappa Delta, um, Rhodes college. And I was a Fiji. So like, uh. you know, Let's Anybody go back to, to this is going to know way too much about my life now. Okay, go for so, it. So, <laughs> so like, let's go back to, and look, my, you know, I have, I have a lot of family that was Kappa Deltas and, you know, my dad was a Fiji, mom was Alpha Z Delta, I was a Fiji. So, I mean, let's go back to 20 year old Kappa Delta Lisa and ask her like, what do you want to be? Was it, was it audit? Uh, no. You know, no. no. 
Absolutely. Not. I didn't do? even know what auditing was. I was originally a chemistry major, <clears throat> minoring in economics, because whatever. This was pre HMO, healthcare reform days, all these things. This is the 90s. And I wanted to go get my master's in healthcare administration. But anyway, um, and I was a third year at Rhodes um, taking PCAM, so physical chemistry, and Calc 3. And I really loved organic chemistry and I really hated physical chemistry. Like I just hated the combination of physics and chemistry. Like give me organic chemistry all day long. And I just hated PCAM. So I was minoring in econ and I was like crushing economics. Like I love economic theory, macro, micro, anywhere in between. I love economic theory, which is going to connect to insurance in a moment. And um, I came home. I was the oldest uh, so I have a brother and I was the oldest and my parents had dropped out of college and started their own business and didn't get their college degree. So my, there was a lot of pressure on me. You know, I was the, my dad was like, hi, hey, you know, you need to graduate. All of our faith is on you, you know, all this stuff. And so um, <clears throat> I come home from college my junior year, I guess it was Christmas break. I don't even remember. And I'm like, I'm changing my major. And that was like, <laughs> did not go over well at all. And you know, my dad, my mom was a dancer and my dad's an engineer. And, um, I always want to impress, I I always, to this day, I want my dad to be proud of me like still to this day. And so I told him I was changing my major and he was, and I was like, I really love economics. I think I'm going to major in econ. And at the time, Rose didn't even have an econ specific because of liberal arts. So I had to major in business administration. And my father literally looked at me and was like, what in the world are you going to do with a business degree? (laughs) He was like, this is before Sam, this is like midnight. He's like, no self-respecting child of mine that has gotten this far along in their life is going to get the thing called a business degree. So James, my point is I had to come up with something that was tangible enough for my father to think that I could make a career of this insane decision I just took. Got it. And and I was like, I'll do this thing called public accounting. (laughs) So then you got into public accounting and finance and you spent, uh, you know, more than a decade in this, but then yeah. you, you, what, what was the transition point that led you from that second stand at Price Waterhouse into insurance in Munich Re? Because obviously starting then, and I'm always interested in how people got into insurance because I think it colors our comments afterwards, which is why I spend some time on it in every episode. Um, you, you spent, you spent 11 years at Munich Re. What was it that led into that position? Why insurance? Why Munich? So, when I started at PwC, I had the least amount of any background in anything to do with audit. Like, I don't even know why they gave me a job other than they thought I was like capable and smart. Right. Um, and because I had minored in economics and I really love financial modeling, they were like, you know what? Nobody wants to do insurance. (laughs) No one. You're going to be assigned to all the insurance clients (laughs) of the firm. So my insurance, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> started like my first week at PwC, they designated me to insurance. And I mean, I loved it because I spent all this time doing dual track and systems and financial modeling and all this stuff. I got to work, you know, at the ripe old age of 23 in Zurich. It's still one of the biggest um, financial divestitures ever, which was when Br- British Tobacco, imagine the irony here, sold off all this insurance company holdings, which is funny. They owned all these health, life and health companies. What? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's like that's like Altria got into that too, you know. Marlboro got into to life and health. They, they got into health and I mean, it's hilarious. You're like, really? I, mean, you I got don't think that? people actually realize that Farmers Life was owned by British Tobacco back in the '90s. So I, anyway, the point is, I spent, I just, I honed my kind of that skill of financial modeling with my love for processes and procedures and. I guess the better way to say it is intangible. Like I love something that's intangible, but that there's a financial construct around. And so I had spent all those formative years at PwC. Like my only non-insurance thing was really Home Depot and I helped them create their global supply chain. Um, I spent all my years doing financial and financial modeling and Munich Re was actually a client of mine. They were a client of mine as an auditor. I helped them do their largest acquisition, which was the CNA acquisition. I helped them do all the purchase accounting. Um, And so I really never wanted to work for an insurance carrier directly after my um, ING Voya experience, Uh, just because I was like, oh, I really want to do the M&A, the due diligence side of it, you know, operational integration and all that. And um, but 
as all things, I went back to PwC and I was doing a lot of work on the mythical i 17, which this was like supposed to have come out and come out and come out. And I guess James to fast forward, I realized like it's not coming out anytime soon, which was fortuitous of me. That was back in 2008, <laughs> 2009. And here we are. And it just got implemented this year. And I was like, so Munich called me <clears throat> because the guy that I'd worked with there, their controller had retired and they were like, we're really looking for somebody that understands our business and that wants to kind of take this on and all these things. And the rest, as they say, is history. So that's why I joined Munich Re. Um, originally, I hung up on the recruiter. I'm like, no, they took bets that I wouldn't last more than 18 months. Um, <laughs> there were like people lost money, lost wagers on me. But yeah, I, I kind of pivoted from the finance side at Munich Re into the operations side, into digital, into strategy. And then I got to see, do some really cool projects for senior, like board of management and senior executives at Munich. Awesome. And um, you, you ended up in a, a variety of jobs at Munich Re, including uh, chief accounting officer, um, EVP chief operating officer for uh, NA Life. And then you got into uh, global chief digital strategy and transformation officer for global reinsurance. Um, that was your last your last job with them before you went to farmers and you were the chief strategic financial officer for farmers insurance and then uh and then you started this great journey of 360 digital immersion so what um before i hand it off to rob you know what what led you to getting into consulting like first off what is 360 digital immersion because that's your your main your main yeah. gig <clears throat> and um what is it and then what led you to to go on your own and uh, and leave the carrier carrier world. Yeah, my midlife crisis in, in, in the flesh. Um, so no, 360 stands for you know like the Da Vinci, like the 360. I, I am liberal arts, you like humanities train, and I believe that we have to look at things holistically, which is the 360. And digital immersion. I think a lot of people think of digital as just this automation track, and I think of it more as like how do you kind of foundationally embed it in everything you do, which is where the immersion comes from. It is a consulting company that I own, that I'm the president and founder of. And I help insurance companies, insurance adjacent companies, and insure techs try to solve problems at scale that other people maybe don't understand how to solve or don't see the patterns of the white space and how to solve it. So that that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. Awesome. Very cool. Um <laughs> Very, very cool. And I'm, I'm excited that, uh, you know, uh, a, a great mind like yours would get into that so you can help people, um, you know, make a make a pretty big leap. It's a it's a lot for for insurance organizations to, to think about what's next. Um, Rob, what you got, buddy? Yeah, Lisa. So I, I want to, um, you know, I'm glad we kind of went through your background so people kind of understand, right, just the, the myriad of expertise and experiences you've had. But you know, most of those were very large firms, particularly Munich Re, right? Uh, you've made the same leap I have going from the corporate world to kind of, you know, forming your own startup and, and helping others. So, you know, you have a, a unique perspective and I know you help just a, a ton of clients. You're kind of ubiquitous on the conference circuit. You're ubiquitous on social media. You have an amazing, you know, fun personality. Where are those problems that you see, right? And, and I'm sure we can spend hours on this, so mindful of time, but like, you know, were there big problems that you saw while you were at Munich Re in particular that made you want to kind of make this leap? And then, you know, as you work with clients, like where are those big gaps from your perspective? And then um, how are you and your company trying to, um, you know, obviously collaboratively, right, but kind of close the the gap and spur innovation? Gosh, that's such a, that's such a great question. And there's so much to it. You're right. We could spend forever on it. Um, but I think like, so that I, I would say there's a, there's a definitely like a group of us that are, I, I call it like almost like credentialed, like, right. Like we put in the time, we climbed the ladder, not because of the title, but because it proved that we have merit and deserve a seat at the table, right? Like we are an outlier, but we also had that, that seat at the table, which for me, it was like really important, especially being female, especially not being an actuary, especially not being somebody that priced products, et cetera, right? Like we all know how elitist we can be as an industry, but okay, let me step outside of that. So that was like one really important thing for me and what I try to bring to the industry and people that I support. How do you credentialize the uncredentialed? I think that's really important that we have that conversation and that we understand that we're not going to solve problems 
if we either isolate all newcomers as well, they don't get our business. And by the way, a lot of them don't. So that's a fair, but like we've got to create inclusion and belonging in that quadrant. And then the other thing is if we just keep doing things the way we've always done them, just mediocrely better. Like, and I mean that like, it's not okay. And I, you know, I, I was COO. So like, I understand what it's like to take cost out and OPEX and pay for it, pay to play. And I had to pay for my own innovation. So what was happening, Rob, is I was, you know, in this really unique lens of running, I, the COO, and I had data and I had digital transformation and I was uh, retiring all my mainframe systems. I was the first one to take all my systems. I took 85% of my systems to the cloud and 80, 80, yeah, 85% back in 2017, 18. That's wow. huge. Like, I mean, I had to hire an, I, I, I remember now how distinctly huge this is because we forget about it in 2023. I had to hire external counsel to review a cloud arrangement because back in 2018, 17-ish, there weren't that many people that knew how to execute cloud contracts. So like, I know it's like 2023 now. And we're like, yeah, that's passe. That's old news. But I guess what happened was, um, I always call it like, capture the flag. I was always looking for at what point do we capture the flag and drive change? And so like clearly I was at the reinsurer level and you can actually kind of see it. If I tell you this, it'll make sense when you zig and zag my career together. So I did the consulting thing for a really long time. Then I went into, I'll call it the financial domains of the insurers, right? Then I move into the reinsurer, like the quant level, which is kind of to me, like theoretically where like I, I used to work on reinsurance as a service. I was working on creating business models that like, you know, I can't talk about a lot of them because they were kind of like black ops secret things. But, you know, just think about it as how do we ensure algorithms themselves? I was like horizon three, horizon four plus plus, and then bringing that back to today. And what I realized, Rob, is that like you can't just do this from one standalone vantage point. So then I thought, oh, I'll go up channel like to get closer to the consumer, which was uh, my farmer's move, right? Like how do I get closer to the consumer? And um, trying to do some things with direct to consumer, even though farmers is an exchange reciprocal company, the life insurance company has a little bit of different behavior patterns. So I was trying to think of... Um, kind of some of the things I was doing at Munich Re, how would I apply that? So like fluidless underwriting as an example, um, you know, all these things. Okay. So I went from- Tell us, Hold on, pause. Tell us what yeah. that is. Fluidless Tell underwriting? What? Yes. Okay. So it's life insurance. So, so when you historically, maybe five years ago, it's all changing COVID and this was before COVID. Um, historically, in order to qualify for a life insurance policy of a certain denomination, like, you know, like, let's say you want a million dollar life insurance policy or something like that, um, you had to go prove that you were healthy Yep. to support underwriting. And what all carriers were doing and all reinsurers were kind of reinsurers, I won't get into all the nitty gritty, but we kind of provide the underwriting manuals by which the direct carriers use at point of risk acceptance. It's like the underwriting method. And um, <clears throat> so we would take, we would have, you know, the insurance carriers would have you go do a blood test and we, we call it fluids. They, they would extract fluids from you, run, run samples on that, everything from cholesterol to blood, you know, all the things that they need to do. And then we would issue like whatever, are you preferred substandard, you know, like whatever the rate class is. So in, you know, reinsurers started working on how do we do fluidless underwriting? So how do we do underwriting without fluids from the individual? So we got it heavily into um, data science. So there was like a huge center of excellence data science teams that were being formed. And it wasn't just unique to my my reinsurer, like all reinsurers were doing it. We we're it's kind of like racing. We were all racing against it. And we were doing these things to empower the direct carriers too. like, how could we have large enough data sets in creating these, um, uh, you know, what data points were relevant if we didn't have the fluids is the best way to think about it. Um, and how could we do what we call underwriting as a service? So I was part of the team working on fluidless underwriting, not the underwriter, <laughs> but I was kind of working on some of the technology and the integration layers and what would that mean? And so I had a lot of experience in that when I went to farmers. Um, and then 
I guess like I was trying to do that. COVID, of course, was going on when I was at Farmers, that little thing called COVID. And um, I started seeing once again that we were still brute forcing this. So again, I have a lot of experience with ERP, with admin systems, with data, with data technologies, with data techniques, um, because I was kind of like at the cutting edge of all that. And then I just really realized this is kind of like my midlife crisis that I just wasn't in that capacity able to drive the big scale change that I really wanted for the industry. Goes back to my economics degree. You know, I'm really worried about the, what I, I often refer to it as this platonic shift in consumers where consumers no longer care about need and duty and duress, which is kind of historically how we've gotten people to buy insurance. It's like a sense of like a proper person does this, you know, who doesn't have this, who doesn't have that. And I was really starting to focus on, well, how do we create things people want? really want, like a new four letter word, want. And so in that vein, I had been working a lot with innovation, a lot with transformation. And I thought, well, you know, I'll go do digital for a while. And my first stint out of the corporate world, I had some non-competes and some things like that. So I left life insurance for two and a half, three years entirely, which was funny because like I had this huge background in it. And I was like, oh, I'll do, go do this little thing called geospatial. And so I went into geospatial and natural catastrophe and parametric, and I became a little bit of, um, I'll say, a little bit of an expert in that. And um, really just kind of fueled my passion for helping insurance and insurance adjacent. How do you do things at scale? How do you do things at like this bigger level? Um, so Rob, that was probably a long answer to your question. <laughs> no, that was perfect. That was super helpful. I know our our listeners and our viewers really appreciate that. <clears throat> Let's, I'm I'm, you know, I come at everything from a tech perspective because I've been writing software since <laughs> I was a teenager, and um, you were that guy. I, yeah, I was that <laughs> nerd, and uh, started this company in my dorm room, and so I've kind of been doing this for a long time. Uh, but but from a technologist lens, so I, I learned insurance through the eyes of writing software for insurance companies, not from actually working in the insurance operations. What what do you think the the real pivotal pieces of technology have been in the last few years that are really actually actually changing the nature of the game in insurance? Not that not the noise and the talk and what's I, actually r- really reshaping the products and reshaping how we deliver them. And how we quote, bind, and pay, and handle claims. What technologies have really been impactful? And, and if you could just pick one that you think is going to be huge in the next couple of years. Gosh. <laughs> so I could probably answer this more like what I think hasn't been the holy grail that everybody thinks it is. And uh, where I think there's been a lot of perils and pitfalls or over over-indexing. So, like, let me give my over-indexing, and then I'll kind of, like, deduce my way down to, like, the ones I think that are the best. I think we've over-indexed on APIs. And, by the way, I I think if you don't have an API enabled, like, you shouldn't, like, I'll say this. Like, APIs were table stakes for me five years ago. I wouldn't even buy your tech if you didn't have API enablement. But I think as an industry, we've over-indexed on APIs. Like, everything can be done because there's an API. Um, I also think we've over-indexed on, um, I think we've gone out of the realm of what business process management, like BPMS, like where we should really be using BPMS as listening, listening and orchestration. And I think we've made it like this, like, I, I just think we've over-indexed and I personally lived through this, um, like an, unnamed, an unknown, unnamed transformation. I think we've like basically over-index that tool and we stretched it to its capabilities. And I think that tool taken out of the context of orchestration is not being used properly and it won't scale properly. So I, I think if you combine all these things together, I, I also think that our cloud strategies weren't sophisticated. I didn't, I don't think we had sophisticated data, data at rest. What data do I need to structure? When do I need to structure my data? How? Can, and I don't think we've kept current with evolving data techniques and capabilities as they're emerging. Um, so I think a lot of people, because insurance is such a long, difficult post-stabilization, like when you implement technology, there's still, most people in my mind are like five to 10 years ago with what they're doing today. 
it's like a, in my mind, like if I had to evaluate, I'd say it's a low, like, like a, probably tech I would have retired. Okay. So if I say all that, like, what do I think has been the most impactful? Oh, sorry. I think we also over index on modularity. Most systems that proclaim modularity are still monolithic systems that entrap you in the system itself. And they are not actually modular. And I encourage anyone that's not a tech person, refuse the demo, ask to speak to the enterprise architect of the software provider, get under the hood immediately. Look under the hood. That, that would be my number one call to action. Because I always tell people, I'm not demoing your product. I just want to talk to the enterprise architect and I want them to show me an architectural diagram. And I can usually tell in like about 10 minutes if it's really, truly modular. So that's like my little point of advice to anybody out there shopping for tech. Yeah. <laughs> if you run across Wardlaw, she's going to want to look under the hood. <laughs> I will look under that hood. Even if you meet me, you know, and, and we're having drinks or whatever. I will meet, I will say we're looking under the hood. Um, okay. So what do I think has been the most impactful? Okay. A couple of things. I think that it was appalling the level of manual processing that we had and still have to this day in insurance that like, by the way, had always been behind the times, never had a like rem remaining place in time and in insurance. And I think digitizing that and just getting rid of paper pushing and even like emails and just this manual routing of things. I still remember people bringing physical checks to my office to be signed. And I was like, I just, no, no, absolutely not. So I think that's huge. Like we just, right. We have to be efficient with our resources and we have to be more like forward. I think the thing, okay. This is like what I would say is going to change the insurance industry the most is, and I talk about it a lot. If you listen to me, I apologize because you're going to hear it again. <laughs> um, I think that tech, tech is actually dynamic. I think of it as streaming and as fluid, and it has the capability to enable fluid and streaming. Just think of things that like not at rest. I remember the first time I, I learned about like data streaming, I was like, what? Like Hulu? for operational data, what? <laughs> and so I just remember being fascinated with this concept. But I think if you think of it, like, almost like the upside down here, y'all, like in Stranger Things, I think we think of the world and the insurance world today is relatively static. But I think the technology and the capability and why so many people struggle to like do transformation and actually start up struggle and, and all these things is that the capability enablement is actually dynamic. And so what we're trying to do this, this thing that I think is going to be solved. And, and I don't know what it is. Like, I think it's like the, the conductor that allows static and dynamic to coexist, which right now that doesn't exist. People have this policy of thinking that that's an API. That's not an API. And so really, I think what's really cool about, and then we'll go to, well, we have to go to generative AI, right? I think the cool thing about it is it can kind of amplify oral communication and contextual understanding in a way that all this digitization couldn't. It can put the way humans, it can put in humanity the way we want to talk and engage, which is typically through description and through talking and, and things like that. So I think that can kind of get us out of that digitization loop. I think that can take that load off of us and I don't mean just automation. I mean, I think it can contextualize so much of what we do in insurance and get us really into that cognitive decision. So I think that can free that up. And then I think the second thing that we have to solve for is, well, how do we actually create products people want, not what we think they need? And so that to me is really that dynamic, uh, everything from like, home and auto and commercial and health. And I was on actually on a advisory call this morning with a, um, a healthcare company that, that does kind of streaming of these things. I think it's like people know right now that their experience is a little uh, intellectually and insulting. They're like, I know it could be better. I literally know this can be better. And so I think that we've got to create that dynamic conduit 
to allow that hydraulic pressure to flow between our processes. And in doing so, I think we need to totally redesign our processes. Now, do I think that piece of technology exists today? I think the capabilities exist, and it's probably something that I spend a lot of time working on. Like, how can I help the industry unlock that? And I know, like, you all do that too, like, right? Like, how do we, collectively we, as people who have spent a lot of time in this industry, kind of see patterns that maybe other people can't see and then bring people in and say, it's not exactly the product market fit you had in mind, but if we did this to it and that to it, right? And I call it like the insurance innovation masters. Those are the people that I believe are going to kind of solve this paradigm. And, and the cool thing is, I definitely think the Lego bricks are there. Like it's like mm. putting it together. Does that make sense? It does. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the the pieces are finally together. Like just, just in general, just looking at technology, this is the first time in human history when you've had extremely fast bandwidth in tons of locations. You have extremely fast compute on the desktop and the workstation and the server. You have uh, really cheap sensors that you can turn into IoT devices everywhere. You've got um, you know, AI coprocessors that are chipsets designed just for AI. You have significant advancements in AI software. Like there's all of these things are converging, you know, cameras and video and photo and LIDAR and, you know, OBD2 port readers for telematics and then wearables for people, all of them are coming together all at once. Yeah. And it's providing a, from a technology perspective, perspective, a limitless set of combinations um, where you can com you can combine a lot of uh, technologies that happen to be coming together. I, I do believe that uh, to to quote um, a well known sci fi quote, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Yeah, you know, it's um, it, it's already here. The components are already here. We have the capacity to do this. There are players that are currently putting all those components together, and they're making big strides. Um, yeah. And so I think that I think that's that's uh, critical, Rob. Um, Take us home on our on our last question. Yeah, so as we're we're uh, wrapping up, Lisa, um, you talked about scale, right, and that desire, and that's really what powers you at, at, at in your company. Um, yet, much of what you described, I hear friction, I hear fragmentation, etc. So, I guess, like at a very you know thirty thousand foot view, how does it scale? Yeah, I mean the the great the great thing about our industry, right, is there's such momentum and power in the, in the volume and the amount of society that we serve, right? And, and what we actually do with society, which is back, you know, we, we buy the investments that help back like nations, right? Like that's like literally what we do. And so I think when you put this together, there are groups of people that understand that this has to be solved for. And we we work together to say, you know, we, we used to always have this little saying, this little adage that we would talk to ourselves about, which is we all predominantly have access to the same checkbooks. And I, I mean that, right? Like predominantly most people are competitive at like, we're all like kind of like pro NFL teams, like we can compete, right? Um, and so it, what it really comes down to is cognitive design. So who are the thinkers? Who are the people that are going to be your innovation masters? And I mean that beyond the transformation team, beyond an innovation team, who is going to be able to compose and decompose this tech? It reminds me a lot of like, I'll take this like home with this. Reminds me a lot of watching children build Legos. And say so the people that are going to scale this are not the people that love the Lego kits. Because a Lego kit, by definition, is giving you a formulaic prescription and just says, build it. The people that are going to create, and this is the 101 of the crossing the chasm. Heed me. You cannot cross the chasm out of order. Your tech, you know, on the chasm, the visionaries and the evangelists, they're the people that do not like Lego kits. They're the people that like tons of Lego blocks. And no matter what you give them, in terms of their Lego blocks and their resources, they're able to design. If you tell them to design X, they can build it with whatever blocks they have. And secondarily, they're the people that go on to be the, the innovation masters and they design the blueprint and the Lego kits. And when you get those people 
to design those blueprints and those Lego kits. Then what happens is you start scaling it by selling the boxes, the kits, right? And I think this is just my hypothesis. What happened is these insurer tax came to the insurers and like, here you go. Here's some Lego bricks. What you going to do? Let's you know, go build something cool. And then they maybe over indexed a little bit on, oh, well, they don't really know what to do. So we're going to take the UI, the dashboard, the this, the that, and the other, and we're going to build all that in our insurer tech. And I'm like, no. What was missing is who is actually designing the three in one. I can build an airplane. I'll keep it back to you, James. I can build an airplane. I can be a helicopter and I can build a cargo ship with the same set of bricks. I just have to change a few parts here and there. That to me is why I stay in this. <laughs> I know you all do too. And that definitely exists. And it, it cannot exist entirely outside of insurance. You have to have some credentials. And it can't entirely exist if you're only insurance either. Like you've got to be able to see those patterns that you don't see and, and deal with technology, you know, that you don't always deal with. So I don't know if that's a good answer to that, but I, I see it. it as being that holistic, composable and decomposable. Like, yeah, here we go. Legos. You're the first Lego awesome. master of InsurTech. I love it, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> The room next to me is filled with every Lego I've ever owned from childhood. I, I That was one of the COVID projects my youngest daughter and I did as we assembled. And we still build Lego together. And I'm about to put shelving on the wall I so that it. all the all, so all the Lego can be on shelves instead of on the floor. Where, and, and so it can be because I, I love Lego. So love the Lego analogy. Let's roll with that. Great, great discussion. Great answers. And, of course, I love just walking through your background because it kind of colors the the resume of a modern day and in, sure tech geek <laughs> right which is you know deep experience in financial services and consulting and then deep experience in the insurance industry itself and uh, using technology as an enabler for organizational change change in process offering new products I, I i think my big takeaway out of our conversation is both in technology and in insurance we have to build products that people want Right. But they actually Your four want letter it. word, man. <laughs> want. And so that's my biggest takeaway that I'm going to be thinking about is, you know, how do we build products? <clears throat> how do we as a technology company build products that insurance companies want? How do our client insurance companies build products that people want? Yeah. Not that they're sold. Great conversation. Lisa Wardlaw, Atlanta, Georgia. There she is. Can't wait to hang out with you in Toronto. It's going to be fun. If you're going to be at the uh, Reuters event, I think it's November 15th and 16th, I believe, in Toronto, Canada. A, eh? sorry, what? Sorry? A, eh? eh? did, like did, <laughs> did you want some poutine and did you want some poutine and maple syrup and some I love uh, poutine? My favorite. Yeah, let's, see, let's have some. So, if you want to join Lisa Wardlaw and myself, we're both going to be moderators at the next Reuters <laughs> <clears throat> uh, Future of Insurance. We got it all and, uh, on the stage together. What? I, I I don't think they'll I, I don't think they're gonna allow that. Like no. we're too we're too much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'd blow through all our time limits too. Um join us in Toronto if you want to hang out with us. Even if you don't wanna even if you don't go to the Reuters event, just like come hang out with us after hours. It'll be it'll yeah, be just great. Meet us. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. just meet us meet us out. Come to Toronto, eh? Have some poutine and maple syrup, eh? <laughs> and uh, say sorry, apologize excessively for everything you do, eh? Sorry. Um, so anyway, great conversation. Lisa, thanks so much. Rob, as always, thank you, sir. Thank you both. Great to see you guys. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks so much. And thank you to listeners out there for tuning in today to Geek Out, our interview with Lisa Wardlaw from 360 Digital Immersion. See you on the next show. The InsureTech Geek Podcast powered by JB Knowledge, jbknowledge.com. It's all about technology that's transforming and disrupting the insurance world. I've been your host, James Benham. That's jamesbenham.com with co-host Rob Galbraith at endofinsurance.com. And thank you for joining us today. Look forward to talking with you soon. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech. So enjoy the ride and geek out.